Bryce Norton, Britain's largest military airbase. 8,000 men and women serve and live in a thriving community the size of a small town. It operates 24 hours a day with seven flying squadrons, two parachute units. Our race going now. A world-class aeromedical evacuation unit. This is our number one priority, get this guy home. And an airport that dispatches and receives thousands of troops back home from war zones. I'm so excited, I wanted to cry. The most seasoned professionals rub shoulders with the newest recruits. Train hard, fight easy. Done correctly, it's a work of art. But it's more than just a military base. Supporting operations in Afghanistan, hosting traditional historic celebrations to the saddest of all occasions. Everything stops for the repatriation to take effect. Inside RAF Bryce Norton. In this program, the police on base conduct a Friday night patrol. Payday yesterday, so today is really the first time people can splash their cash. An urgent flight is requested for Afghanistan. If we need to offload an aircraft for an airmed to go, we will just offload it as, as fast as we can so they can get away. And a celebration at the officers' mess. It's really exciting for us to see this bit fire coming past because we're all spotters at heart, really. RAF Bryce Norton never closes. There's over 50 flights a day on the three kilometre long runway, with seven flying squadrons housed on five square kilometres of land. 1,500 buildings sit here, ranging from base hangar, air dispatch, elite parachute training schools, and accommodation for thousands of live in personnel. Over 8,000 people work on the base, a mixture of military and civilians who work in various roles, giving it the feel of a small town. And it's like one big happy family here on the base, you know? Everybody knows everybody. So, uh, yeah, it's good. But everything here happens behind a 10-mile perimeter fence, ringed with barbed wire. To most civilians, it's a secret world with its own unique culture, rules, and codes of behavior. To enforce the rules, the RAF run their own military police, who monitor security around the clock. 24-year-old Corporal Carl Brenchley and his colleague Corporal Richard Johnson are on a night shift. I originally wanted to try my civilian police, but uh, I was told I was too young, potentially, that I'd had lack of life experience, and uh, I tried the RAF police and they welcomed me. He's off to inspect an aircraft carrying troops back from the front line. Obviously, with the, the air bridge from here to Afghanistan, um, we are constantly doing the air transport security. The MOD sometimes lease civilian aircraft to supplement their fleet. These need to be cleared before being handed back over for non-military use. They're looking for any hardware or sensitive material that might have been accidentally left on the aircraft. Quite a pain in the arse this job sometimes. Yeah, because it's obviously quite a lot of seats on the, on the aircraft. We have to go through checking each one. They're also after any evidence of smuggling. And a lot of um, people trying to take stuff to and from Afghanistan that they shouldn't be taking. We have a whole collection of knives, um, swords. Someone tried to uh, bring back a motorcycle in component pieces recently. And one of the most serious crimes we've dealt with is an individual trying to smuggle over 12,000 cigarettes um, out on a flight with him, which is, which is strange. We can't understand it, because in Afghanistan and places like that, you can buy cigarettes out there really cheap. Whereas here, it's expensive. So I think the guy got something wrong somewhere, was trying to send ex uh, expensive cigarettes out to a cheap country. That's it, that's done, nothing on board. With the aircraft given the all clear, they can continue patrolling the rest of the base. It's private property um, owned by the station commander. Um, we have the Armed Forces Act, which sort of is a list of rules um, that people have to abide by, sort of 
simple things from you must wear a berry when you're outside all the way to you must not drive with a mobile phone. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of things on there that people <laughs> choose to ignore. Although not technically covered by the highway code, safe driving rules still apply on the base, enforced with the help of CCTV. This is the one I'm putting on disc. He obviously fails to stop at a stop sign there and he hits a cyclist. And people, people say to us, sorry, you've not got anything better to do stopping me for not stopping at stop signs and things like that, but if you don't stop at stop signs, that sort of stuff can happen. I you know mean, you're putting other people's lives in danger, technically. They, it could have come off a lot worse. The police don't just deal with security on base, they also respond to welfare issues. I mean, I've been to a few incidents where um, somebody's punching a window or causing criminal damage to a door, and then you turn up and they just break down in tears. And they explain they've just got back from theatre and they've lost their key, they need to get into their room. And I mean, you, you, you can just sort of sympathise with them and just turn around and say, OK, let's try and find a way into this room. Let's, let's go to the guard commander, let's get a key for your room and let's get you in there. The world of a regimented military airbase supporting a war effort over three and a half thousand miles away isn't your average workplace. 174 has to be back on the 31st. Ascot is the nerve centre of the base that schedules all the RAF flights in and out of Bryce Norton around the world. The crew that need to be in, on the ground in Madonna aren't going to get there until around about um, mid-morning on Friday. Sergeant Kerry Murphy-Brown is constantly sourcing aircraft to send vital kit, cargo and mail to the front line to boost morale and to get troops back home on time. It's a high-pressure job far removed from life off the base. You drive through the gates of RAF Bryce Norton in the morning and you're entering almost a different universe. People are very serious, people are, are rushing about because they've got high priority tasks to do. It's like its own little country, if you like, in RAF Bryce Norton. And you drive out of the gates at, at five o'clock, at seven o'clock, and you're back into normal world where people don't care what, how many bars you've got on your shoulder. But when she's in uniform on the base, Kerry's not afraid to assert her sergeant status to get the job done. But he's going five and a half hours earlier than he was expecting. Next, if you get hold of him, he needs to speak to the squadron. Yeah. My service personality, I am so bullshit, it's untrue. I am bossy, I know what I want, I expect masses from myself, but I expect the same from everybody else. During 2012, over a thousand wounded forces personnel were brought home from Afghanistan on aeromedical flights. All too often, Ascot are required to respond to a medical emergency. Can we please get a spec aircraft for one P1 patient? He's currently in theatre, so we're looking at a departure for tonight, please. A P1 is a patient with life or death injuries. He's having an operation in Afghanistan, but needs to be flown home if his condition allows. We can get the CCAS team here within two hours. No problems, we'll get back to you. CCAS stands for Critical Care Air Support Team. They're the most urgent aeromedical evacuation service who respond 24-7 to severe medical emergencies. I'd be kind of tempted to say, this is what you're doing. <laughs> Kerry's chasing 99 Squadron to get a C-17, which will be converted into a mobile intensive care unit to bring the patient home. All the information they have to go on is that the patient's been operated on in Afghanistan and needs to be flown home if his condition allows. Cast out of Bastion, no intermediate landings, ground level cabin out. You have got a patient and you don't know the extent of their injuries. All you know is the medical teams are telling us that that patient needs to get home quickly and we do everything we can to achieve that. We use the C17 because that is able to get all the way into theatre and back again quickly, doesn't need fuel and is our aircraft of choice for spec aeromed. On occasion, we've had C17s airborne and we've had to contact them and tell them to come back to Bryce Norton because we need to commandeer that aircraft so the task that that was doing suddenly becomes of a lower priority because we've got an aeromedical flight to achieve. 
Unfortunately, a C-17 has just landed at Bryce and is now earmarked to be turned around quickly and sent back to Camp Bastion to pick up the patient. As far as we're concerned, we'll do it as fast as possible if we need to offload an aircraft um, for an airmed to go, uh, which does happen, unfortunately, quite a lot. Um, we will just offload it as, as fast as we can so they can get away, uh, depending on how quickly the, uh, the new crew comes in to uh, take the C-17. But until there's more news on the patient's progress in the operating theatre, all the C-17 and Ascot can do is wait. So it's coming. Next, a race against time to launch an aeromedical flight. We are putting in diplomatic clearance requests into the various embassies. And a special dining in night at the officers' mess. Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, who commanded the battle hour by hour. The team at Ascot schedule all flights in and out of RAF Bryce Norton. They're dealing with an urgent mission to send a C-17 out to Afghanistan to collect a critically wounded soldier who's undergoing an emergency operation. You can get a crew and a firm together for a 1630Z departure. How does that work for you? Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, no problem. Meanwhile, senior aircraftsman Mel Jones has been busy negotiating airspace for the flight. We are putting in diplomatic clearance requests into the various embassies. It does kind of get your adrenaline going because you know that you have somebody's life in your hands. OK, so this is the plan, and it kind of makes sense. I don't want it to be my fault that that person didn't get back at the time that they should have got back. Every minute counts when somebody's injured out there. This is our number one priority, get this guy home or this woman home. Nothing else matters. Flight Lieutenant Matt Lehman will be piloting the C-17 if the patient is well enough after the operation to fly. Almost everything else gets dropped for an aeromed. Uh, it's the highest priority thing we do. For example, today we're launching an aeromed and we've uh, cancelled another task in order to get it done. Um, so normal freighter tasks, everything like that gets cancelled and uh, the aeromed becomes a priority, not just for us, but also for the engineers because they need to get an aircraft ready to go and fully fuel uh, as quick as they can. How are you doing, Mel? Sending MRS. Okay. All yeah. the airfields happy. Yeah. He's got it. They're already preempted. We're now literally waiting from to hear from the airmed team to find out if it's a requirement now whether we do need yeah. to go and oh, pick the patient him. up. As we say, until he's out of surgery, we're not going to know how stable he is or if he's going to be able to fly. So we should get a response on that in about 25 minutes. You can't afford to sit there and get all emotional and upset about such things because you're no use to anybody if you do that, so you just crack on, get your job done. Twenty minutes later, the Aeromed crew are back with an update. The emergency operation has failed. The patient has died and the flight is no longer needed. Unfortunately, the Aeromed officer has just been in and confirmed that there's no longer a requirement to pick up the Aeromed patient. Um, so we will be cancelling all the arrangements we've put into place. Sir, it's Kerry. And just to let you know, the um, Aeromed won't be required. No. On a day like that, you go home and you think, oh, that's, you know... That brings you down because you know that you weren't able to help. I'm sure my feelings pale into insignificance when it comes to how families and loved ones must be feeling. Not everyone at Bryce Norton gets to go home at night. Thousands of personnel both work and live on the base. Everything's structured around rank, from the way subordinate personnel salute their superiors to their social and living quarters, or mess. There's three, the junior ranks mess, the sergeant's mess, and the officer's mess.
In the junior ranks, Miss, Warrant Officer Pat French is inspecting the food for today's lunch. What is it? What are you making? Shooting pasta bay. All right, yeah. I can see, mate. Where's the pasta? The Air Force is a working base. The lads coming in here for the lunch, I should like the wood to in a factory. Um, so it, it is a large working country. However, we have to bear in mind that it's also the junior ranks, it's the, it's, it's the airman's home as well. This is their front room, if you like, or their dining room out there in the, in the front there. The canteen is the focal point of the mess. What's his name? Junior ranks eating here include aircraftsmen and corporals, junior technicians and senior aircraftsmen. I do feel like it's sort of a bit of your home, because it's where you eat, it's where you spend most of your time, apart from your room and work. It's the second and third most place, visit the place you come, so... Yeah, it's, it's quite good. You've got a coffee room and all that sort of stuff, it's good. A corporal earns an average of £29,000 a year. Housing provided on the base is far cheaper than in the civilian world, costing around £65 a month for the new single person's living accommodation. Until recently, £134 per month was deducted in return for all meals served in the mess. A pay-as-you-dine system has now been introduced. We provide four meals a day for up to 1,000 personnel a day. However, the average is 300. Um, this is the herb crust heat. There'll be about four choices on the a la carte survey. There's normally one live bar, which at lunchtime is omelettes, and then there's a deli bar across the way there, which is they do hot sandwiches, salads, uh, field rolls, field baguettes, paninis. An infantry soldier, if he's out working hard in the field, he will eat up to 6,000 calories a day, whereas uh, uh, RAF clerk in the sedentary post, 2,000. They only eat what they need to eat. Obviously, you never always get every customer being happy, but hopefully at least 90% of them are happy. Pat believes providing good food, regardless of rank, is fundamental to a motivated Air Force. Catering is one of the three pillars of morale. You get three things right, you get, you're, you're, you're laughing. One's accommodation, two's food, and three is pay. If you get them three correct, everything else will just fall into place. The rigid separation of the messes and their proximity on base is all part of a deliberate military message. You have to ask the question, why do we have three? Why can't they all eat in one? We have to have ethos in that chain of command, that military ethos has to be in place. What we do here, we do in theatre. Oh. That same command structure has to work wherever we are. And if, it, if you don't get the building blocks right here, where it's nice and safe, it's Bryce Norton, it's not going to happen in theatre. Bastion, Kandahar, take your pick. When a corporal's promoted to the rank of sergeant, he or she can now enter the more prestigious world of the sergeant's mess. Sarah Virtue has worked here for the last 15 years. This is the main reception. So this is the, the entrance that they all come in every day. We have mess rules, which everybody who comes into the mess has to keep to. So for the dress code here, it would say on a function that the dress code would be green, so that would be a relaxed dress, blue, amber or red. So red is formal, so they would be wearing their mess kit, their, their mess uniform, and ladies would have to wear the appropriate dress. And it, it will carry on and list every single thing, every rule that there is in here. Our clientele here is very different than the rest of the camp, I would say. Um, a lot of our customers are older. A lot of them are from the, the old Air Force, very traditional, very set in their ways. So we can sell a lot more roast dinners and cottage pie. Unlike in the junior ranks mess, diners are waited upon and there's a strict etiquette on how staff must behave. Staff have to eat in our own designated staff restroom and not in the dining room. It's that sergeant and above type thing where it's their dining room, they don't want people in there just willy nilly getting, doing stuff, if you know what I mean. The sergeant's mess has several areas where members can relax. So we have what's called an, an ante room. Um, this is where they can come, 
just like their lounge, really. This is our snooker room. We have two full-size snooker tables, and this is quite a popular place for the lads to come. So a lot of the entertainment is in here, and we have acts and bands and everything, so the whole mess comes alive. Today, the sergeant's mess is hosting a retirement lunch, which is packed with well-wishers. It will be the dining out of a warrant officer who's been in the Air Force for a very long time, so he will have invited all his work colleagues and friends and some family, um, and they come here and they'll have a carvery roast and it'll all be very traditional and then they'll it will turn into a bit of a party afterwards for them. And then dependent on how long they have a bar extension for, they could be here till one in the morning. <laughs> but we never have any trouble because even, even though they'll be in the bar having fun, there is still the etiquette and everything else that goes with it. It gets a little bit noisy now because they're all coming in. It's a bit like children coming in to lunch when they've been at school. And so, dear Lord, here in Dubai, we change the water into wine. Bless us now, if we shall lack, for today we seek to change it back. Amen. Amen. They won't be allowed to go to the toilet at all unless they have what's called an admin break. Anybody who chooses to go to the toilet when there isn't an admin break will be fined. Money raised from fines goes both to charity and is put behind the bar. During Sarah's time in the mess, she's witnessed many members transition out to civilian life. Sometimes I think there is a big wide world outside of these gates and sometimes I don't think people sort of realise how institutionalised they have become from the Air Force. And I do know lots of people who've struggled terribly once that they've come to the end of their career when they've lived in the mess. Not far from the sergeant's mess is the officer's mess which has its own style, traditions and atmosphere. Here we are in the foyer of the officer's mess. Oak panelled uh, with very plush carpet. It's quite a formal area to receive uh, guests uh, on their arrival into the mess. The officer's mess is clearly for the, the officer carder, uh, and whilst that maintains uh, an element of separation and discipline within the chain of command, it also allows everyone to relax amongst their own peer group and colleagues, and that's as important for the sergeants and warrant officers and the junior ranks as it is for us. There's a strong tradition of uh, playing the piano uh, both uh, after dinners, uh, but also perhaps uh, more unusually if we uh, lose a colleague, uh, maybe in a flying accident or uh, on operations, uh, the tradition of burning a piano is, uh, is practised here. <laughs> Another tradition at the officers' mess is the annual Battle of Britain dinner, celebrating the heroic achievements of the RAF in World War II. Everyone's dressed in their traditional number five uniforms, or mess dress, reserved for very formal occasions. This evening is one of those special events where we're celebrating the Battle of Britain and it's combined with a formal dining in evening. It's sort of like you see in the Mayor's Dinner in London. We all, we all sit down for, the, for dinner, they parade the flags of the various squadrons into the, into the dining hall and we get dressed up in all, all our finery for the event. We have 10 dining in nights a year. And it's really exciting for us to see this bit far coming past because we're all spotters at heart, really. On a standard dining in night, we'll um, start with uh, sort of pre drinks outside for half an hour um, and then we go through for dinner when they call something like that. Normally it's just a gong. <laughs> These are all commissioned officers who receive their appointment from the Queen and enter at officer level. They follow a different career path from their corporal and sergeant brethren who rise up through the non-commissioned ranks. Of the 17 officer branches, only one is for pilots, but all may take strategic roles which could eventually lead to becoming the top brass in the RAF. 72 years ago this night, our country was locked in a pitched battle for survival against a single foe and fought solely in the air to determine the fate of nations. 
The military believes these traditional events help bind the officer community, which will all play its part when they're deployed on the front line in much tougher circumstances. It was Air Vice Marshal Keith Park who commanded the battle hour by hour. However, in the air, we claimed 47 enemy aircraft destroyed and another 39 damaged for the loss of only 13 of 11 groups fighter aircraft. <laughs> The work-hard, play-hard spirit is on show at such dinners and is a defining feature of life in the armed forces. Next, police investigate damage on the base. The reason I reckon this is the car here is it's got his lights on and he's got damage. And provide security for a repatriation ceremony. Yeah, there is somebody. You know, someone's colleague, someone's friend. You do your best by them. That's got 317, Roger, and a uh, we'll report ready for retaxi. RAF Bryce Norton is the military's main airbase in the UK, with air traffic control sending out flights around the clock. With so many staff living on base, it's the job of the RAF police to maintain base security and make sure the work hard, play hard culture doesn't get out of hand. I'd have one guy sort of try and uh, have a go. Corporal Carl Brenchley and his colleagues are finishing a quick meal in the junior ranks mess before starting an evening shift. It's Friday night and it could get busy. It was a payday yesterday, <laughs> so uh, today is really the first time people can splash their cash. Millionaire's Day, as it's been come to known, because uh, everyone gets paid. They've got sort of 15, 1,600 quid in their back pocket. We do get a lot of people trying to drink drive. Um, I think the reason for that is they just think that the Road Traffic Act doesn't apply on here, which it technically doesn't, but we have our own rules governing use, uh, you know, drinking and driving. Back at the station, Corporal Dan McKenna has received a call. He had a loud bang outside. I thought, oh, straight away, fireworks. And he said, hey, he reckons he saw a car just go round and he reckons he hit a post and then drove off. They make their way to the scene of an accident where a guard is waiting for them by a damaged signpost. Hey, sir, how you doing? You say you see the car? Yeah, well, a light blue fiesta, apparently. Okay. That's all we got, because we heard bang. I'm running from that corner there, and it was shot that way, that direction. OK, I was going to spin around, see if I can find it. Right. Give the guys a ring. Just around the corner from the damaged sign, Carl spots a suspect car. Yeah, this reckon this is the car. He's got his lights on, and he's got damage, which could be it. He's obviously just parked it and ran. The way he's parked up, you can see he's probably, uh, probably drunk. Unfortunately, there's no driver there, um, but we have a system on camp so we can work out who the vehicle is by their vehicle pass and who's registered it on camp. Dan starts trying to match up the car with its owner, who could be the driver. Got the guy's name. Uh, we just need to find out where he lives so we can go and breathalyze him. The owner's a corporal who's living on the base. The database gives them a room number but not the name of the exact housing block. There are multiple blocks to search around the base, so they'll have to work by a process of elimination. They need to work quickly. If the driver was drunk, then they want to breathalyze the alleged culprit before any evidence of alcohol wears off. We can't be sure what block he's in, so we can't start using force to get into a block that could not be his. Hey, mate, it's Brentshaw from the police flight. Can you open the door a second, mate? I don't know, you're all right. Can I come yeah. in and talk to you for just a second? So, I need to talk to you about your car. No, no, no. I just want to ask you to do a complete a breathalyzer test. Yeah, I just want to see if you're under the influence of alcohol. He blew well over the limit. 
and uh, I arrested him for impaired driving and uh, straight, um, straight after I cautioned him, he, he said to me that he'd done it. He, he didn't realise he was so drunk. He just said he thought he, he felt fine and he said uh, I had a little bit of an incident with a corner and he just laughed about it. He said uh, I thought it was OK but obviously I, I, I took it a bit fast. Is it heating on? Oh yeah, good, it's freezing. On base, the RAF drink driving limit is 35 milligrams of alcohol in 100 millilitres of breath, exactly the same as on Civvy Street. This alleged driver blew almost three times over the safe limit. We took him to our custody suite where he was booked in for the night. First thing in the morning, as soon as he was sobered up, he was referred for impaired driving, leaving the scene, um, driving without due care and attention and criminal damage to the signpost. The standard penalty for drink driving on base is losing a full month's pay and the corporal will now await his trial. The RAF police on the base also have a very important and unique role. In 2011, Bryce Norton took over from RAF Lynham as the main base for the repatriation of most service personnel killed on operations abroad. They are codenamed Operation Pabe and involve key members of staff on the base. Today, RAF policeman Sergeant Martin Towsey is on a shift covering security for a repatriation ceremony. I think I've missed four or five of the maximum. So I've done the majority of the repatriations these days. We start off about 11.30. We go out and do a security sweep of the area. Because you've got to remember, bear in mind that the repatriation ceremony it's just that, it's a ceremony, it's not uh, a funeral. So it'd be hard to say how many we've done, unfortunately. Too many is the word. Yeah, far too many. After the security sweep outside the base, Towsey and his colleague, Corporal Andrew Williams, park up a short distance from the repatriation centre. I have to park the car where I can keep an eye on the ceremony, keep an eye on the roads and keep an eye on the fence lines, so I'm not interfering with what's going on on the ceremony, but I can react if required. Before the aircraft lands, a movements embargo is enforced all around the runway. As a sign of respect, there will be a total ban on all airside vehicles and aircraft movements for the duration of the approach and landing of the repatriation aircraft. Embargo one, that means no vehicle traffic. That means the aircraft's due in, in 15 minutes. This is the RAF's busiest station. You just can't hear nothing now, can you? The C-17, which has flown direct from Camp Bastion, lands each time at exactly 1.30 p.m. It's unfortunate, it's, be, it's become sort of like a, a normal duty now, hasn't it? Yeah, and it's become, it's, yeah, it's become part of your routine, so... <laughs> we don't let it become routine, simply because, you know, there is somebody you know, someone's colleague, someone's friend. You do your best by him. We're very conscious of the fact that we are sitting here in a day go yellow outfit, so we tend not to get out of the car as much. We will, however, get out when it's time, when the, uh, the fall and come back along the road here in front of us. We'll get out, we'll salute, pay our respects. The C-17 stops outside the repatriation centre, where the coffins are carried off by a bearer party in front of family members gathered for the ceremony. It's always a sad day. It's, you know, someone's passed away and they're being brought back to the UK to be added back to their loved ones. It's, this is where it really hits home to them because they've had, you know, people telling them that their loved ones passed away. But here, you know, there's a ceremony Back of the aircraft opens and a box comes out, draped in a Union Jack. And you feel for him. You know, Bryce Norton police fully understand it because you know, we've had to repatriate one of our own. In May 2012, 25-year-old RAF policeman Brent McCarthy 
was killed on duty in Afghanistan. You don't expect people so young to come back in a coffin. After uh, Brent McCarthy got repatriated, I just couldn't deal with the, the last post anymore. Uh, that got a bit close to the heart, that one. The fallen servicemen of today's repatriation are driven off the base. Sergeant Towsey accompanies the families to the nearby town of Carterton, where the Thames Valley Police will then take over the escort. All, all the RAF couples who work here at Bryce are very proud to take part in the repatriation ceremony. They're escorting the, the families uh, down through the two villages, down to the garden. It's just a great honour, really, to be part of it. Next, troops get their last hot meal before heading to Afghanistan. They're sort of 18, 19, 20 years old, you know, really, they're boys, and we feel it part of our sort of duty to ensure that they go onto that aircraft with a really nice hot meal inside them. And a battle to get a TriStar Airborne for a refuelling mission. Uh, we call 706 Damien um, because uh, 706 equals 13, which is in the key. Operational 24-7 one of RAF Bryce Norton's main roles is dispatching troops from all over the country to deployments overseas. The Gateway is a hotel and mess on the base. It's open to everyone working here, regardless of rank, and provides a refueling station for servicemen and women passing through on their way in and out of the front line. It's a 24-hour operation. You know, someone here all, all hours of the day and night preparing for the next flight or the next meal, really. It's an all-ranks facility, so it's, that's quite a nice thing as well, because obviously with a three-mess sort of uh, environment normally on a military establishment, um, you can't always get to uh, eat, eat with the people you want to eat with. You get officers mixing with senior NCOs and um, general servicemen as well, so it's quite nice from that point of view. Phil has served up a lot of meals to servicemen and women during his 28 years in the Air Force. I served in Belize, the Falkland Islands, Croatia, Cyprus. So, you know, really, I've been, been to, a, to a fair few places I probably wouldn't have seen, you know, they're not, they're sort of off the beaten track. He recently retired, but like many, he misses the buzz of working on the base so has come back to work here as a civilian. Gone from uh, sort of a management role in the RAF back to being on the shop floor. But as I say, I quite enjoy being on the shop floor, actually. Bryce Norton is, in effect, a small town. It's, it's the hub of the Royal Air Force, very vibrant, very dynamic station. There's aircraft arriving and leaving all hours of the night and day. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here as a serviceman and I'm continuing to enjoy it as a, as a civilian as well. For many troops being posted overseas, hot food at the Gateway is their very last meal on home turf before operations begin. Phil and his staff do their best to make it a good experience for them. Some of the guys going out to some pretty hostile places, actually, you know, they're sort of 18, 19, 20 years old, you know, really, they're boys, and um, we all know where they're going, and, you know, we feel it part of our sort of duty to ensure that they go onto that aircraft with a really nice hot meal inside them. You know, it might not seem like much, but I'm sure they appreciate it. Our heart goes out to them, because we know where these guys are going. We know we're all wives and mothers. In fact, one of the, one of the ladies there, her young sons in the rifles is out in Afghanistan serving at the minute. Just want to make sure I've looked after. I've actually come through Gateway House as a passenger, and um, it, it's very difficult, you know, leaving your family, and you know, in some cases, going away for si up to six months. So, you know, it's said that um, an army marches on its stomach, and it's absolutely true. It's always been true. Now, having that hot meal inside you is important for morale.
Bryce Norton is home to seven flying squadrons, each of whom have their own dedicated aircraft. 216 Squadron fly the TriStar. In the 1980s, the RAF converted these former passenger jets into flying tankers for air-to-air -air refueling. Ground engineer Dean Stainton knows all too well what it takes to keep the queen of the skies airborne. Working on 216 is, uh, is uh, more of a challenge. I have worked um, smaller fast jets and training aircraft. Um, it's uh, inherently because these aircraft are bigger. More things to go wrong. Today, Ascot, who schedule all flights in and out of RAF Bryce Norton, are working closely with 216 Squadron. I eat Sergeant Miss Brown at Ascot. They need to coordinate a rare TriStar refueling mission to both the US and the Middle East to support the air bridge to Afghanistan. We've got uh, two TriStars due out on trails today. Trails are where we send out uh, tanker aircraft in support of fast jets so that they can do air to air refueling en route. They'll take off from here and then they'll join it with their, with their business, as they call it, with the small jets. Uh, and then they'll, they'll refuel them in the air at certain points to keep the smaller aircraft in the air for a longer period of time. Today, there's a fault with one of the two TriStars that are supposed to be flying out of the UK. We've been told 951's possibly a four-hour delay. As ageing aircraft, the fleet of TriStars are notoriously high maintenance. Historically, the serviceability of TriStars has sometimes been a little unpredictable. The TriStar engineers even have a nickname for one of the most notorious of their fleet. We call 706 Damien um, because uh, 706 equals 13, which is in the key, and it just uh, keeps the young lads on the toes on an evening at 2 in the morning when they're walking down the back of the aircraft. Engineering problems are continuing to delay the planned departures, causing stress at Ascot. We've not quite got to chocolate biscuit stage yet, but we're veering towards it quite quickly. Maybe on a plain digestive sort of level at the moment. The engineers are working flat out, but with no departure time confirmed yet, Kerry needs answers. It's not exactly clear what's happening with the aircraft and we're struggling to get that information. Give me two ticks I'll find out for you. The TriStar's been towed out by a little yellow car that's a really good sign. Finally, the aircraft are ready to go, and Kerry gets the news she's been waiting for all morning. So the eastbound one is getting the first airborne slot. Three hours late, but almost perfect plan. Both TriStars are now taxiing to the runway, waiting to take off. And while the Ascot team book the flights, air traffic control manage the aircraft's actual departures. Both taxi now, they're both chasing each other down the taxiway, and that's very much a relief. Come on, come on, come on. That's one airborne. Hello, we have liftoff. We need a bigger window. And don't forget that Inside RAF Bryce Norton will be returning to Sky 1 HD on Thursday the 9th of January at 8.